My dear old friends, I would like your assistance in one of those little experiments uh, with which I amuse myself here in my study. When you first read Dr. Heidegger's experiment, it sounds like a science fiction story, and a pretty unexciting and old-fashioned one, too. And if a lot of you figured it that way, I can understand it. Just look at the ingredients. First, the standard mad scientist, that very singular man, old Dr. Heidegger, a very strange old gentleman, who, like his four guests, was sometimes thought to be a little beside himself. Second, the standard science fiction background, a gloomy laboratory festooned with cobwebs, a magic mirror, a ponderous book of magic, more props than a fun shop. Third, the standard time travel device, in this case, not a machine, but the liquor of the fabled fountain of youth. And finally, the good old time travel miracle, the quick trip back to youth, and the jolting return to the present. Ah, we grown old again, so soon. Looked at this way, the story's pretty corny. Not phony, just corny. Let's face it. Dr. Heidegger's experiment is not the greatest story ever written. It's not even among the very best Hawthorne ever wrote. I think it's foolish to try to get more out of it than there is in it. But maybe there's more in it than a TV science fiction gimmick and a mad-eyed professor. After all, a short story can't do everything. If it can create one character, or cast a strange new light on a single instant of experience, or conjure up an atmosphere or distill an emotion. Maybe that's all we can ask of it. A short story can't show us the whole house of life. All it can do is open a door and give us a glimpse of a corner of a room never seen before. But the funny thing is, for every reader, it's a corner of a different room. Stories aren't words fixed on a page. They change their form and color with different readers. Try to imagine the first readers of this story back in 1837. They were few in number, well-educated, genteel, raised in an atmosphere of strict Christian, even Puritan morality. A bit stuffy, I have no doubt. My guess is that for them, the main charm and value of the tale was contained in Dr. Heidegger's final words. Yes, my friends, you're old again. And look, the water of youth is wasted on the ground. Well, I do not regret it. For if the fountain gushed at my very doorstep, I would not stoop to bathe my lips in it. No, though its delirium lasted for years instead of moments. Back in 1837, what Hawthorne's readers were looking for, I think, was a moral. A kind of entertaining version of the sermon that they slept and snored through on Sunday. If we have made mistakes, have we not learned from them? Do you imagine we would repeat our errors? The moral Hawthorne's readers drew, I suppose, is this. If we had our lives to live over again, we'd make the same mistakes and come out just as badly. And doubtless in 1837, that made people feel quite virtuous and satisfied with themselves as they identified with the wise doctor. An improving story, they told each other. But does it improve us today? I have my doubts. Probably human nature today is no different than it was in 1837. The difference is that we know more about it. We look at it differently. We know it's more complicated than it appears on the surface. We regard it with less assurance, with a greater sense of mystery. Good writers feel such things generations ahead of their first readers. Did Hawthorne? 
Well, on the surface, Dr. Heidegger seems a pretty standard character, the ironical, wise old man, superior to the rest of the foolish human race, perhaps a little like uh, Prospero in Shakespeare's Tempest. Is there anything below that surface? See. Si. Well, for one thing, Dr. Heidegger is a magician. He tampers with the natural order of things. But Hawthorne also tells us, so casually we might miss it, that once, when a chambermaid started to dust the magic book, the skeleton rattled, and the bust of Hippocrates, the father of medicine, frowned and said, forbear. Could that be a warning to old Heidegger not to meddle with the laws of nature? If so, is the moral of this story a deeper one than it might have seemed in 1837? Is Hawthorne talking from the grave to those who have come after him, who loose the atomic bomb, who pollute the atmosphere, who talk about changing the very genetic nature of man? Interesting question. And how about old Heidegger himself? What about that curious episode of his youth? but my beautiful young Sylvia grew ill. It was not a serious disorder. I prepared a prescription for her. She swallowed it and died on our bridal evening. Is there something odd, something sinister about the good doctor? Does the story of my beautiful young Sylvia deepen our uneasy feeling that Heidegger may be not wiser and more virtuous than his guests, but merely more unbalanced, more led astray by confidence in his own unnatural powers. With Heidegger are associated legends and images of death and decay, what today we call the rejection of experience. Uh, remember, Sylvia died on her bridal evening. For my own part, Having had so much trouble in growing old, I am in no hurry to grow young again. With your permission, therefore, I will merely watch the progress of the experiment. Is this wisdom or an evasion of life? Is the moral to be drawn the one readers felt in 1837? Or is it the one we feel more strongly now, that life is to be lived fully, not evaded? Perhaps there's something to be said, after all, for the poor, deluded guests. We must, must have more. We, we must go to Florida and, 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 and find the fountain and then stay close by so that we may drink the water continually. Yes, we must go. Yes. Quickly. At least, they wanted to live, to feel, even if it meant committing the same old follies. But Dr. Heidegger? My poor Sylvia's rose. It appears to be fading again. I love it as well thus, as in its dewy freshness. Is the doctor in love with decay and death? Is there something in this grave, quiet, mysterious little tale that we can sense today and that may have been missed in 1837? One last thing to think about. Is Hawthorne telling us that all this actually happened? Look at the mirror. Was it all a delirium? Were the poor old souls in the grip of hypnosis? Is this whole tale a dream, a nightmare? an emblem of the uncertainty, the ambiguity, the shifting, baffling surface of human life itself. Perhaps the story called Dr. Heidegger's experiment is itself an experiment, performed on our own consciousness years after Hawthorne first conceived it.